that you couldn't buy anywhere, uh, anytime, and to do it, uh, I've uh, got to do a dirty trick on Brother MacDowell. <laughs> and we have before, uh, we've gone home at night, we've had some really good times here, and just going over some old time songs, choruses that... Uh, uh, are familiar from way back yonder mm -hmm. and they've been really really special and the idea of this James you want to get your guitar uh, Bruce you won't even have to sing the little girls will sing and uh, All right. you don't mind strumming it do you <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> I just want you to get a taste of it <laughs> and the idea is this this is the kind of thing you can do with your family and with the children this is the kind of thing that they'll just absolutely love never forget it that's been probably many years ago when uh, Bruce used to come to the basement of my home where the church was at and uh, used to sing with his children and then sang here with the children and stuff I've never forgotten I, he starts it I can just about sing it myself but you don't want to hear me you want to hear the girls and so uh, if you were here the other night you sang do Lord Lydia Mariah you were here uh, all you girls back there, come on up here. James was here. Nathan, come here, Nathan. Come on, you, you were here. See, the, that's how kids are. They love it. They absolutely love it. And you're going to love it, too. There's just going to be nothing like it. We got time tonight, Sunday night. You came to get a blessing. You don't want to do it. Oh, 
My kids still come home and get around the piano and sing. And we used to have a, we used to live in an old farmhouse, had a great big dining room, and we had a table big enough to sit everyone around it. We had a, uh, a wood burning stove in that dining room, and we had a piano in that dining room. And uh, like I said, the rooms were very big, so we would eat, and after supper, uh, one of the girls would go to the piano, start playing the piano, and sometimes we would sit there literally for an hour, an hour and a half, and just sing songs uh, together as a family. And uh, Brother Art is right. Uh, the kids never forget that, and when they, when they get together, they always want to get together now and sing. Well, the piano's back at my house, and so when they come over, we still have Sunday dinner, and not all the kids are there. It's very rare that we ever that we get everyone together at the same time but uh, there will be half of them there and uh, we'll get together and sing some songs and it's a blessing and they never forget that and uh, one of the things when Joanna was going through some difficult times in her life one of the things that Jesse said to her she said Joanna I don't understand how you can do some of those things and think that way. What about all those songs we sang together? Didn't those things mean anything to you? And uh, you know that was sort of a that was sort of a, a knife just uh, going right through her because uh, they did mean some things to her, and they still do. And sometimes your kids get out and they have to uh, you know they have to hit a couple hard bumps on the road of life before they realize that uh, the things that they were taught uh, in the home as children were the right things and sometimes they go away for a little while and then they come back and I'm thankful that God never gives up on them and uh, you know don't you ever give up on your kids uh, I've never given up on any of mine they haven't all done all the things I'd like them to do but brother I'll tell you what I can see that the Lord is dealing in their lives and the Lord works on them and uh, you know I'm thankful for what God has done it's been good to be here with you this week, and I've really enjoyed the time and the fellowship and, uh, you know, playing the guitar and singing. I only do it for two people. That's the Lord and Art, so uh, he got it. <laughs> and uh, I I've enjoyed this week. I've enjoyed coming in each night. You've made it easy for me to preach, and it hasn't been hard, and I trust that uh, tonight the Holy Spirit will work and deal in your heart and in my heart and just uh, do what he wants to do in our midst. Um, you know, when it comes to preaching uh, of the last message, it's always difficult. Um, sometimes you think, well, you want to leave a parting shot that'll get them homesick for heaven or preach on the second coming or preach on the rapture or preach a, a positive, uplifting message like that that will you know, sort of highlight uh, everything that's been done. And uh, I guess it's not going to be quite that way tonight. Um, but I am going to preach to you, Lord willing, uh, the message that I told you about early in the week. And uh, that message is going to be tonight, why some people cannot stay in a Bible-believing church and why some people cannot leave a Bible-believing church. And uh, I hope that it will be a help to you. I don't know how many of you here are members of this church. If I was up here, there's no doubt in my mind what church I'd be a member of. I'd be a member of this one right here. Because uh, I like the Bible, and that's what I come to church for. I've never understood uh, people that play church. I've never understood that mentality. When I was lost, I was out in the world, and I didn't want to have anything to do with it. And once I got out of the world, and I got into church, and that's where I wanted to be. 
And I, I go to church because I want to go to church. I don't go to church because I feel it's my obligation or my duty or my responsibility. I go to church because that's exactly where I want to be in church around God's people. And I hope that something will be said tonight that will be a help and a blessing to you, a parting shot, and um, maybe uh, something that uh, you, you might not have to deal with it right now, but maybe something that you'll have to deal with down the road. Take your Bible tonight. And turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And right before I came up here, uh, I got a phone call. My wife got a phone call. And uh, one of the ladies uh, that had been coming to the church for a couple of years uh, told my wife, said, uh, we'll not be back to the church. And we're going to go up the road to the church. And the church up the road claims to be a Bible-believing church. Now you have to realize this. You have to realize that there's Bible-believing churches, and then there's Bible-believing churches. There are a lot of churches that say they believe the Bible, and from all outward appearance, they do believe the Bible. But what do they specialize in? Do they specialize in the Bible, or do they specialize in other things? And what you get seeing is that there's a lot of churches out here where, yes, they use the King James Bible, they say they believe the Bible, but they specialize in different things. They specialize in programs, they specialize in things for the kids, they specialize in other things, and they just sort of sprinkle the Bible in there. A Bible-believing church is a church that specializes in the Word of God, and that's the main thrust, and that's the main objective, and yes, they have other activities and social things, but that's not the highlight, that's not the big deal, that's not the thing uh, that everybody goes to a Bible-believing church for. And in Hebrews chapter 10, I want you to see a few verses here, verse 23, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23 it says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke one another unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. A couple things to look at. Number one, Hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. If you've professed Jesus Christ as your Savior, hold fast to that profession and uh, don't waver in that thing and stay on that platform and take that stand and let people know that you're a child of God, that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, He is your Savior, and that you love Him and you love His Word. Then it says, let us consider one another to provoke one another unto love and to good works. We are supposed to be provoking to one another. The trouble is, we usually provoke one another to the wrong things. We aggravate or agitate and provoke uh, somebody to maybe envy or jealousy or anger. And the thing that we're to provoke one another to is to love and good works. You say, how do you do that? By getting up and being a testimony. By telling somebody else a blessing that God's done for you. Just like Tammy that said tonight, uh, we've prayed some general prayers, but we've also prayed prayed some specific prayers, and we've seen God answer our prayers, you know what that does? That provokes you to want to pray and have some of your prayers answered also. I never fail to go into church and somebody will get up and say, man, the, the Lord really blessed me this week and gave me the opportunity to talk to somebody, and uh, I, I was able to lead them to the Lord, and I'm sitting there thinking, man, why wasn't that me? <laughs> You know, it provokes me to want to go out there and do more for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I want you to notice in verse 25, it says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. We're supposed to gather together and not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I ask tonight that you would bless the preaching of the Word of God. I'm thankful for these people that have come. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. And Lord, sometimes things happen that people don't understand and people don't realize and people don't know about. 
And sometimes there's questions in their mind as to why these things take place. And Lord, tonight I pray that you would uh, reveal these things and that God, you would speak to our hearts about these things. And Lord, I know that Father, maybe down the road, some of the people that are sitting right here tonight, six months down the road, may not be in this place. I hope they are, Lord, and I pray that they would stay. And I pray that they would get in, and get in deep, and get in all the way. And Lord, if they do leave, I pray that you would send others to come <clears throat> and fill their place. But Lord, I ask tonight that you would help us to see these important things about a Bible-believing church. And Lord, may it help these people and may it settle their hearts. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Since I've been saved, I've always been a member of a Bible-believing church. I've never been a member of any other kind of church. The first church that I joined and became a member of was Brent Baptist Church in Pensacola, Florida. Dr. Peter Ruckman was the pastor of that church, and I joined that church. And uh, I'll give you the reasons later why I joined that church, but that was the first Bible-believing church that I ever joined, and I never went. I never uh, joined another church that wasn't a Bible-believing church. Uh, the next church that I joined was over in Foley, Alabama. Uh, Wayne Munn was starting a church over there, Bible believer, Bible believing church, and I went over there and I joined that church and worked with Wayne in that church. Then my wife and I moved up to the Ohio area and moved up to the Cincinnati area. And uh, up in, in Ohio, I joined Mount Hope Baptist Church, which was pastored by Brother Jack Grigsby, who was a Bible believer. I left Mount Hope Baptist Church and went to Emmanuel Baptist Church in Dayton, Kentucky and joined that church and was a member of that church for a number of years. And Brother Jim Tarkington pastored that church. And then I moved from uh, over in the Cincinnati area to where I presently live and I began pastoring the Grace Brethren Church of Sinking Spring, which is a Bible-believing church. And uh, I've been a member of that church for the last 10 years as I pastored that church. In the almost 33, or in the 33 years that I've been saved, I've always been a member of a Bible-believing church, and in that time, I've seen a lot of people come and a lot of people go. I've seen people come in and get in a Bible-believing church, and they said, man, hallelujah, this is it, this is great, this is wonderful. I've seen them come in with a smile. I've seen them come in rejoicing. I've seen them come to the place where they foundly uh, uh, found a, uh, finally found a place where they felt like they fit in and had a good time and then I've also seen them turn around and leave. A fellow said one time, Leroy Wright, he said some of them look better leaving than they did coming. <laughs> but when they leave, they leave, they're upset. That joy's gone, that smile's gone, that, uh, that shout of, of uh, hallelujah, I have found a place where I fit in is gone and out they go. They drop out. And a lot of times, people that sit in the pew, they see folks come and they see folks go, and they don't understand what's taking place. Sometimes the preacher doesn't even understand what's taking place. Sometimes people go without any explanation at all. They never say why they go. They just drop out. They just fall through the cracks, and all of a sudden they're gone. And there's no explanation. You go around and you try to talk to them. They can't even give you a good reason as to why they don't come. But I'm going to give you some reasons tonight why people can't make it in a Bible-believing church. A Bible-believing church is a lot like a train. It pulls into the station, and some people get off, and some people get on. It goes down the road a little bit, pulls into another station, some people get off, and some people get on. But you know something? The train is headed for a destination. They might change engineers. They might change conductors. And many people may get on and many people may get off. But the thing just keeps on heading down the track till it gets to his destination. And that's the way it is with a Bible-believing church that God has planted in an area for the Word of God to be preached. Some people will come and some people will go, but the church is going to keep on going. It's going to keep on doing what God has placed it there to do. And the Lord is going to make sure that He gets the people to that place that He wants there. And then it's going to be up to them as to whether they stay or whether they pull out. Now, people go to church for different reasons. 
One of the reasons why people go to church is for convenience. Some of you drive a long, long way to go to church. To, to, to church. Some of you drive 40, 50 miles to come to this church. And that's a blessing. That's the way it is in a Bible-believing church. Because you see, people that really want the Bible, a place where the Word of God is the specialty, a place where the Word of God is magnified, if a person really wants that, they'll be willing to make the drive. I used to say when I was driving about 30 miles to go down to Brother Jim's church, if the place is alive, it's worth the drive. And brother, you can get in there and uh, hear the singing of the saints and hear the preaching of the Word of God and it was worth every mile and every minute that we spent in that car getting to that place because we knew once we got there, we were going to get fed by the Word of God. And so it was worth the drive. Some people go to church for convenience. They wouldn't, they wouldn't think of driving any more than five or ten minutes to get to church. Other people go to church because it's the old family church. In other words, grandma and grandpa went there, mom and dad went there, and so it's the family church, and so that's why they go to church. Other people go to church because of the programs the church has. And today, you can find churches that will have all kinds of things. They'll have bowling and uh, for the young people. They'll have uh, uh, all kinds of programs for, for the women. They'll have all kinds of programs for the men. They, and, and there's churches in my area. I know fellows that go to that thing. And brother, they're always taking trips someplace. They have outings. They go here and they go there. And they specialize in the programs. You start talking Bible. And man, these guys' eyes roll back in their head. They don't know where you're coming from, where you're going to. Because they're not learning anything from the Word of God. But they like the church because of the programs. And you know that particular church claims to be a Bible-believing church. Yet when I talk to the people that are connected with that church, they're very shallow. They don't know the Word of God. Some people go to church to ease their conscience. In other words, if they miss, they start feeling guilty. And so they say, well, I'm going to go to church because I want, I want to feel good. <laughs> And I want to have a clean and clear conscience about this thing. So they go to church to clear their conscience. And when people go to church for those reasons, they might come into a Bible-believing church. They might join a Bible-believing church. But guess what? The day's going to come when they're going to leave that Bible-believing church. You know why? Because they're gone for all the wrong reasons. Now, you look around... And you see people come in, they stay for a while and they leave and you say to yourself, why in the world did they leave? The first church I ever joined, I wanted to be a part of that church. I walked into that church, I heard the preaching take place, I heard the teaching take place. I saw 500 people get up and sing praises unto God. I saw young people there that were excited about the Lord Jesus Christ. I heard them get up and, and shout the victory and have a good time when they came into to the services. And I could identify with those people. I enjoyed being there. I didn't want to be a hurt. I didn't want to be a, hinder, a hindrance. I wanted to help that church every way that I could. And, you know, my little part in that was, if the doors were open, I was there. I made up my mind that by the grace of God, I was going to be faithful. Every time they had a meeting, I wanted to be in that meeting. I didn't sit in the back, and I don't have anything against those of you that sit in the back, but bless God, I wanted to be right up here in the front. <laughs> you know why I wanted to be in the front? Because when I got under conviction, I didn't want to have to walk all the way from the back down here and get down and get things right. So I sat right up in the front, about the second row, and I got under conviction the first three years about every time I went into church. You know, I was there at the altar. I was pray and asking God to help me with certain problems that was in my life but I wanted to be a help I didn't want to hurt or hinder the work in any way and so I felt like the least I could do was be faithful to come to the services then the other thing uh, uh, you know if they they said we need somebody to help dig a ditch well I could dig a ditch so I jumped in there and I started uh, helping and they had a work day. I went to the work day. If something needed to be done, I tried to do it. I just wanted to be faithful. Then they said, well, we have visitation. I didn't know what visitation was, didn't know how to visit, but I thought, I'll learn how to do it. And so when visitation came around, I went out and started going on visitation. 
Then they said, well, there's a rest home. People need to go to the rest home. I went to the rest home, went to the jails, went on visitation, went to the street meetings, did all the things that I could possibly do. You know why? Because I wanted to be a part of that group, that Bible-believing church, and I just didn't want to be somebody sitting on the fringe saying that I was a Bible believer. I wanted to be in there doing everything that I could possibly do. I got called to preach, and they used to set up an old tent down in the colored section of town. And I looked at that thing, and I thought, well, somebody said, Bruce, why don't you sign up and, and go down there and preach? And I thought to myself, I don't want to do that, man. Them people from the church will come down there, and I'll just my knees will be knocking, and I won't do a good job. And uh, I almost didn't do it. And then I thought, no, you know, I'm a part of this work, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign up. And I signed up. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I'll outsmart them. I'll sign up on Wednesday. They'll be in church. I'll be down here at the tent. Guess what? <laughs> they played hooky, man. <laughs> they came down to that tent on a Wednesday night, and oh, man, I thought, I wish that uh, I hadn't signed up. But I went ahead, and I preached and did what I could do. And uh, I've never been able to understand this mentality where people play church where they come in and they just sort of come in to maybe be seen on a Sunday morning. Uh, you don't see them back Sunday night half the time. You don't see them around on Wednesday. You never see them around on visitation. I've never been able to understand that kind of mentality because I felt like if I was going to be in that church, I wanted to be in there all the way. And I saw people come and I saw people go. And as I pastor a church down in Sinky Spring, a very small community, uh, we run about 60, 70 folks on a, on a fairly regular basis. And what I see is I see people come in and I see people leave. I see people come in and stay, some for six months, some for a year, some for a couple years, and then they go out. And here's what I've observed about people that can't make it in a Bible-believing church. I've observed this. The reason why they can't make it, number one, is because they don't keep their heart right with God. You see, if you don't keep your heart right with God, you cannot come in week after week after week and stand the Word of God being preached and declared unto you every single Sunday. The Bible tells us that we're to watch our heart. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, it says, Keep thy heart with all, uh, with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. In Proverbs 23 and verse uh, 7, it says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. If a person doesn't keep his heart right with God, then brother, let me tell you something. Eventually, that person will start resisting the Word of God. You'll get up to preach, and they'll just sort of shrink back into their little shell, and they'll say, mm, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know about that. I don't think that's right. I think that's his opinion. I think that's uh, just the way he sees it. And they begin to resist the Word of God. And then after they start resisting the Word of God, they start to resent the Word of God. They start to resent the truth. And they say, hmm, I don't like that. I've seen people that I've, I've taught out of the Bible on child discipline and taught what the Bible has to say about disciplining your children and raising your children. And because they've resisted the Word of God for so long, they started resenting it and they would sit there and go, I see them shake their head. I said, don't shake your head. You're shaking your head. No, you're not shaking it. No, at me. You're shaking it. No, at God. Because I'm reading it to you right out of the Bible. And they sit there and they, they resist and then they start to resent the Word of God. And then eventually they start to rebel against the truth. They start to rebel against the Word of God. The truth will either change you or you won't be able to keep sitting under it. It'll either make a change in your life and you'll either line up with it or you'll come to the place where you just can't handle it and you can't stand it and the next thing you know, out the door you'll go. That's what happens to a lot of people. When the heart gets hard, people get cold, people get indifferent, people get unconcerned and there must be a change in their life or else they're going to get out of a Bible-believing church. 
Not only that, there's some people that cannot stay in a Bible-believing church because of their lifestyle. Their lifestyle doesn't line up with the Word of God. And when your lifestyle becomes contrary to the Word, either you have to change your lifestyle or you're not going to be able to sit under the Word of God. Bible believers have convictions. You have convictions. You're a Bible believer, you have convictions. Your convictions might not be the same as my convictions. I have some convictions. As Bible believers, we have convictions. We have convictions concerning separation. I don't preach a lot about separation. You know what I, I preach? I preach, have some convictions about the Bible. And if you're convicted about the Word of God, and you love the Word of God, and you study the Word of God, then the Word of God is going to show you how to live your life. The Word of God is going to show you how you should be separated. The Bible says, Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. And you sit there, and you read that thing, and you say to yourself, What does that mean? And you start to study that, and you realize that there's some things that God wants you to withdraw yourself from. The Bible says that we're not to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the the world. If any man loved the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And as a Bible believer, you and I have convictions, and we have some convictions about separation. We might not all have the same convictions. We might not all be at the same place, but what we do is we believe this book, we read this book, and then we line up our lives according to the Word of God and according to the truth. And some people come to a Bible-believing church and they say, I'm going to live a life contrary to that Bible and guess what they just can't stand under the word for a long period of time you have convictions about child rearing some of you now I'm sure in this place not everybody has the same convictions about it but some of you homeschool some of you send your children to a Christian school some of, them, of you may go to the public school but as a as a Bible believer you start reading this book and you start con forming some convictions. You have convictions about training your children regardless of what the world says. At least I hope you do. The world says don't train them. The world says let them go. The world says reason with them. Don't whip them. Don't spank them. Don't uh, uh, discipline them in any way. Just let them go. And so all throughout our country last year, uh, we had kids marching into high schools and shooting other kids uh, right there in the high schools. And brother, I'll tell you what, you have a mess. Uh, even out there in the country uh, where I live, you have armed sheriffs, deputies, walking in the halls of the public schools out there in the country. You know why? Because these kids are being raised in homes where there's no training and where there's no discipline. Not only that, as a Bible believer, your lifestyle and your convictions are going to cause you to have some belief in some doctrines that you believe are right and you believe are the right doctrines from the Word of God. And you see, there will be people that will come to a Bible-believing church. They'll hear these things. They won't line up with them. They won't allow their lifestyle to line up with them. And so eventually, they come to the place where they can't handle it. They can't stay. And bye-bye, out the door they go. One of the other things that I've observed and I've seen as a reason why people cannot stay in a Bible-believing church is because their priorities are not right. Every single one of us, we have certain things that we hold high on the list of priority. The idea is to make God number one on the priority list. Everything else falls beneath that. In other words, for some people, God is number one priority. The church is a priority. The Bible is a priority, and these things top the priority list. And if you uh, uh, love the Lord and love the Word of God, then uh, you ought to put those things very high on the priority list. And if you do that, you know the Lord's going to take care of you throughout your life. 
and He's going to make a way for you, and He will make a way for things to be done in your life, and He'll make it so that uh, uh, even when there's obstacles that look like that's blocking the way, He'll make it so that you can continue on down the path of life. My assistant pastor, Dale Scott, a man whom I have a lot of respect for. He is an engineer for General Electric. They test all these uh, jet engines out there at the People's Test Site. He came to me a few years ago and he says, Brother McDowell, he said, I, I wish you would pray with me about a certain thing. The company wants me to move to Cincinnati. He said, they want to give me a raise. They want to give me a higher position. They want to keep me out there and groom me for about five years in Cincinnati and then bring me back here to where I can take over and be a, uh, a, you know, a, a supervisor in uh, the test plan out here. And he said, I'm, I'm praying as to what God wants me to do. And I said, okay, I'll pray with you. So we began to pray, and every now and then I would talk to him, and I'd say, when, when's the deadline? When, do, when are you going to have to tell him? He'd say, oh, i got a month yet. And we'd pray, and every now and then we'd talk about it. Finally, it came down to about a week before he had to give him a decision. He had to let him know. And I said, do you know what you're going to do? He said, yes, I know what I'm going to do. He said, I'm going to stay. He said, I'm not going to take the promotion. I'm not going to go. And I said, okay, why are you making that decision? He said, you know, I've been in this church all my life. He said, the Lord has allowed me to teach the young people. The Lord has allowed me to uh, uh, be the Sunday school superintendent and do things connected with this church. He said, if I leave, I'm going to take my family. I'm not going to have a church like this to go to. And uh, I'm going to be coming into a church on the ground floor. And he said, I don't want to, to make that kind of a move and take my family out of there. And uh, he said, here, I know there's people that will pray when a problem comes up. I know that uh, the Lord is working and things are uh, being done. And he said, the reason I'm not going to take that, he said, the only reason I would be taking that job over there would be for more money in a better position. And he said, to be quite honest with you, that's not what is important in my life. God was important in his life. God was high on the priority list. The church was important in his life. The church was high on the priority list. The Bible was important in his life. The Bible was high on his priority list. So he told him, no thank you, I'm going to stay. For many Christians... If it came to going to a ball game or coming to revival, they'd go to the ball game. You know why? It's high on the priority list. There's people that come to the church down there that sports is everything to them. And it wouldn't matter. I mean, you could be having a revival break out in that place. And if a ball game came up, you could count on it. They would go to the ball game and forget about the revival. You know, when sports is number one on the priority list, you won't be able to stay in a Bible-believing church real long. And people put other things high up on the priority list. And so eventually, they drop out. They sink into the cracks. They can't take it because they put the house up there. They put the sports up there. They put the family up there. They put the hobby up there. They put the job up there. And they don't put God high on the priority list. Oh yeah, they'll say, I love the Bible and I love the Lord and I want to be in a Bible-believing church. But they're going to go to a church where they say they believe the Bible, but there's not a whole lot of pressure on putting God number one. A fellow told me one time, I never forgot it, he was right. He said, whatever you have to do to get them to come into church, you're going to have to do to keep them in there. And so you know what I've done? I've said, I'm just going to preach the Word of God. I'm going to teach and preach the Bible, and if a person comes to this church, they're going to come to this church because they want to hear the Bible preached and the Bible taught. And yes, we'll have some activities, and we'll do some fun things, and we'll do some things with the teenagers, but our priority is going to be on the Word of God because what you do to get them in is what you have to do to keep them. I'll tell you another reason why people don't 
stay in a Bible-believing church. They're too easily offended. Take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And people get very easily offended. In Matthew chapter 15, it says in verse 55, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James and Josie and Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and his, and his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. You know what Jesus did? Jesus offended people. And when a person doesn't want the truth, they get offended. Look in chapter 15. Chapter 15. It says in verse 12. And uh, the Lord is talking there. And he says in verse 6. Or verse uh, 7, ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou, uh, knowest thou, that the Pharisees were offended after they heard these sayings. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall in the ditch. You know, the disciples came around and said, Now, Lord, don't you realize that what you said and, 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 and uh, what you said to those Pharisees about the commandments of men and, and the tra tradition of men and the commandments of God, don't you know that that offended the Pharisees? Lord, don't you understand that you have offended the Pharisees? You know what Jesus said? He said, let them alone. Jesus is putting out the truth. And the Pharisees got offended at the truth. And Jesus said, don't worry about it. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. They're both going to fall into the ditch. And you know when the truth goes out and people get offended, folks go around and say, oh, don't you know you offended so-and-so? Listen, if they got offended over the truth, leave them alone. If you go running after them, if you go running after them, you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to apologize for preaching the truth. And you don't apologize for preaching the truth. You stand, you preach the Word of God, you preach the truth. If it offends them, then that's their problem because their heart... And Jesus said, let them alone. I don't like to see people leave a Bible-believing church, but I know this. When they're easily offended, eventually, out they go. Take your Bible one more time and look in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26 and verse 31. Then said Jesus unto them, he's talking to his disciples. He just had the supper with them. They just had, he just uh, had communion with them. And they sang a hymn and they went out. And Jesus said unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Then Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. And you know what? Peter denied Jesus that night. Sometimes the truth, when the heart is not kept right in the sight of God, Sometimes the truth comes down the aisle and it offends the person. They get offended. And they leave. 
And if that happens, it's because they don't want the Word of God. One of the early presidents, I forget which one it was, might have been Lincoln. He used to go to a little house, a little church outside of Washington, D.C. And uh, people would ask him, why do you go to that church? Why do you go down there? He said, because every time I go there, that preacher steps on my toes. He went there because he knew that he could go into that place and count on the preacher preaching something and saying something that would get on him about his life. People today, they don't want people or preachers stepping on their toes. And they get offended. You know the first church I went to? The first year I was there, that thing split. (laughs) You know why? Because people got offended. You'd be surprised at what offends people. You know one of the things that they said offended them? His tone of voice. Can you imagine a person getting offended over a preacher's tone of voice? But that's what happened. And you know what the preacher said? He said, hey, a lot of these people are, are, are just like a dog. He said, you know, you can take a dog and you can say to that dog, you beautiful thing, I love you. And that dog will hunker down, man, because he thinks he's going to get hurt, you know, because he's listening to the tone of voice. Or you can say, You ugly dog, I'm going to take you out behind the house and shoot you and blow your brains out. He'll sit there and pant and wag his tail. He said, that's the way people are. He said, they're not listening to what you have to say. They're not paying attention to the words that are coming out of your mouth. They're listening to the tone of voice. And if they don't like the tone of voice, it offends them. I think some people walk into church, some Christians walk into church with a spiritual chip on their shoulder, just daring somebody to knock it off. (laughs) And you know, if that's the way you are as a Christian, one of these days, you'll walk through that door, you'll get offended by someone, you'll get offended by something, the preacher will say something that offends you, and out you'll go. Too easily offended. I mean, the first year I got saved, I saw people that got offended over the speech of the preacher. They said, his speech is rude, it's crude, he's too crude. Well, listen, if you're getting the truth, why are you coming? I mean, if you're getting the truth, is there any harm in putting the the cookies down on the bottom shelf where you can get a hold of it? I mean, do you want somebody talking over your head where you don't understand what they're saying? Or do you want somebody talking in such a manner that you know and you understand exactly what they're saying? And brother, sometimes the speech might be a little rude and a little crude. And the Apostle Paul said, I did not come to you with the uh, 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 the, the wisdom of man's words. He said, I came to you in a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And brother, he used rude, crude, crude speech many times. The truth was going out. People get offended. Oh, I don't think a preacher ought to talk that way. I don't think he ought to use that kind of language. Too rude, too crude. Some people get offended because they don't get catered to. I found out that some people expect to be stroked when they come into church. You got to stroke them, you know. You got to pet them. You sort of take your, you know, shake their hand and Pet him on the back a little bit and say, nice guy, nice girl, I'm glad you're here and hallelujah and praise God for you and all that. And if you don't do that, they say, oh man, the preacher didn't even say hello to me this morning. Didn't get my hand shook. He just turned off, walked away, got, uh, uh, didn't pay any attention to me. And that offends them. Boy, it's a good thing you didn't go to the first church I was a member of. <laughs> because you could be talking to the man and he'd just all of a sudden turn around and walk off. But you see, some people were there because they wanted to hear the truth and the Word of God. And it just didn't offend them, the mannerism. Not being catered to. I mean, you'd be surprised at some of the things that people get offended at. One of the things that offended those people was when uh, uh, folks would get up to sing a special. And we had specials being sung. And uh, somebody get up and sing one of those specials, you know. And all of a sudden, some of these young fellows that were called to preach, they'd get to shout and they'd say, praise the Lord and hallelujah, jump up, wave a hanky back and forth like that. And somebody would say, oh man, that was awful. 
they just messed up that song by doing that. (laughs) And it offended them because someone got happy in the Lord and shouted the victory a little bit and enjoyed the Lord because they were getting a blessing from the words of the song that was being sung and their hearts were being set on spiritual things and they just got a little emotional and couldn't contain it and jumped up and said, Praise God! Hallelujah! And somebody sit back there and said, Oh, disgusting! just absolutely ruined that song. People get offended over all kinds of things. Now that music, too loud. Don't like that loud music. But they'll go go home and turn that television on and you can hear it three rooms away. But the music's too loud. Singing's too loud. All kinds of things offend. And when a person is easily offended, you know what happens? Eventually, in the Bible-believing church, they get offended, and you don't see them. They leave. They go. Sometimes people can't stay in a Bible-believing church because their problems knock them out. You see, in a Bible-believing church, you can be sure of one thing. The devil will make sure that you have some problems. (laughs) And uh, sometimes people let the problems knock them out. You have problems, you come to this church, I'll guarantee you one thing, eventually the problem will get preached on. And the Holy Spirit will deal with the problem. And then you'll have to decide what to do. And people have problems. I I know every one of you in here has problems. Every single one of you sitting in this building tonight... You have problems. And you know, you come in here and the Lord's able to give you some light on those problems and show you some things and give you some wisdom so that you know how to deal with those problems if you'll just come in and take what God has for you and deal with the problems according to the the, the way the Holy Spirit deals with you. But some people, they don't like that. They have problems and, uh, you know, you preach on their problems. Next thing you know, they're gone. They're out. Had a fellow leave the church one time. I'll show you how people are. We had a cross hanging in the back of our church. Now, I probably told you this, but I'll tell it again. Had a cross hanging in the back of our church. Missionary came, so I took the cross down and put it back in the back room so he could show his slides up there. A couple Sundays went by, and uh, one of my men came to me and said, Brother, uh, where's the cross? I said, the cross? What are you talking about? He said, the cross, it was up there on the, on the wall. Where's the cross? I said, I guess it's still back here in that back room. I took it down. He said, well, you going to put it back up? I said, why? He said, well, I think you ought to put it back up. I said, okay. And I walk off and I got to thinking, why? Well, that's funny. Why would he come to me and ask me about that cross? I got to thinking about that. I wonder if somebody's upset because I took the cross down. Probably is. So I didn't put the cross back up. (laughs) Next week, the guy came to me and said, he said, Brother McDowell, you better put the cross back up. And that's all he said. And I thought, I better put the cross back up or what? You know? And so I didn't put the cross up. And eventually... A couple families left the church. And so, you know, I do my pastoral duty. I go over there to the house. I knock on the door and I start talking to them. And uh, I ask them, I said, you know, I haven't seen your church for a while. I'm concerned about you. What's the matter? We're not coming back. I said, oh, why not? He said, well, it's your preaching. He said, every time I come in there, it's just like you whip me. He said, I go out, I feel like I've been whipped. I said, well, uh, you know, no one else has got that complaint, but this guy, he's complaining. I said, oh, well. I said, I, I'm just preaching the Bible and preaching the truth. And uh, I said, is there anything else? And he said, yeah, there is. He said, uh, how come you took down that cross? And his wife kicked him right under the table. Man, I saw him go like that and look at her. I said, oh, the cross. He said, yeah, why'd you take that cross down? And I said, well, let me ask you something. Who put the cross up? And he said, well, 
me and some other people, we decided that the wall looked kind of bare and kind of plain, and so we decided to have a cross made and put the cross up. I said, oh, okay. said, did you have a business meeting on this by any chance? No. You just decided amongst yourself that you would put it up, right? He said, yeah. I said, did you think that maybe it would offend somebody if you put the cross up? He said, offend somebody? Why would somebody be offended on putting the cross up on the wall? I said, well, did you ever consider that maybe somebody would be offended? He said, no. And I said, well, I guess I took the cross down the same way. I said, number one, I never dreamed that it would offend anybody if I took it down. And number two, I said, if you didn't have a business meeting to put it up there, I sure didn't have to have any business meeting to take it down. Now, I said, if that's your problem, if that cross being missing is your problem, I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put it back up, see you Sunday morning. I went back to the church, put that cross back on the wall, and I haven't seen him since. <laughs> you know why? <laughs> he had a problem. And he, he just didn't want to deal with the problem. And a lot of times, problems knock people out of a Bible-believing church. Then there's some people that will never get out of a Bible-believing church. <laughs> and hopefully that's your case this evening. Hopefully you're a person that says, I am a Bible believer. I love Jesus. I love the Bible. I want to always be in a Bible-believing church. Let me tell you, number one, if you're looking for a perfect church, forget that. Because there are no perfect churches. Number two, if you ever find the perfect church, please don't join it. Because you'll mess it up. But as far as the Bible-believing church is concerned, you know, that's what I want to be. I want to be in a Bible-believing church. There is something about a Bible-believing church that is right, that is good. There's a spirit of liberty. There's a spirit of joy. There's a spirit of rejoicing. And brother, I'll tell you what, when it comes to church, I don't want to go into some dead morgue-like place. I want to go into a place where people can get excited about Jesus. I want to go into a place where they can shout. I want to go into a place where they'll sing at the top of their lungs. I want to go into a place where my spirit gets charged when I hear the preaching of the Word of God. I want to go into a place where His book is exalted, where the name of Jesus Christ is lifted up, where people love the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word. Brother, let me tell you something. When I got saved, I fell in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. When I got saved, brother, the name of Jesus began to mean something to me. Before I was saved, Jesus was just a word I used when I wanted to be profane and use profanity. But after I got saved, brother, somebody would mention the name of Jesus and I thought about my Savior and how that He had saved me. Somebody would mention the name of Jesus and I would think about my Redeemer and how He redeemed me from sin and bought me out of the hawk shop of the devil. When I heard of the name of Jesus, I would think of my protector, the one that watches over me and takes care of me and protects me every single day of my life. My little girl Julia, every night she says, Daddy, are you going to do it? And she means this, am I going to come up and pray with her? I said, yes, honey, I'll be up to pray with you. And we get there and she says, Daddy, I like it so much when you come up and pray with me because I, you remind me that Jesus is watching over us. And I pray and I say, God, watch over Julia. Don't let her have any bad dreams. Give her a good night's sleep. And I know that you're the one that never sleeps and you're always on duty and you're always on guard. And Lord, just give her security and peace and let her sleep sound and peacefully. And she can't go to sleep hardly without me coming up and praying for her like that. And she knows this. Jesus is her protector and Jesus will watch out for her. I like to be in a place where Jesus is exalted. Because He is not only my protector, He is my provider. He is my guide. He, he takes care of me and guides me and, 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 and feeds me and gives me the things that I need in this life. Jesus does that. He's my friend. He's, he's been a friend to me when, you know, I looked around and I didn't see anybody else much. Maybe the wife and maybe the family, but brother Jesus has always been there. Not only that, He's my Lord. He's altogether lovely. He's my light in the darkness. He's my comfort when I'm ill and down. He's my strength when I'm weak. He's my refuge 
when I'm scared. He's my song in the night. He found me when I was astray. He came to me when I was wicked, vile, and ungodly. He saved me when I was in my sin. He loved me and died for me when, when no one else cared. He encourages me and keeps me going and keeps me going and keeps me going. And brother, I'll tell you what. I want to go to a church where they say, Jesus, He's the one. I want to go to a church where the Lord Jesus Christ is magnified and lifted up and He's the center of attention. I don't want to be the center of attraction. I want the Lord Jesus Christ to be the one that people look at. If you go out of here and forget everything that I've ever said, so be it. But I want you to go out of here and remember that Jesus... He's the one and He'll be with you and He'll love you and He'll take care of you. And that's why I go to a Bible-believing church because in that kind of a church, Jesus is going to be exalted. I want to be in a church where people don't magnify man and don't magnify the flesh, but they magnify Jesus Christ and His Word. I like the Bible. I love the Bible. The Word, the Scriptures, the truth. A book that holds the answers to all the questions that I have and ever will have. The Bible makes things so simple. I don't have to worry about stuff. These people sit around, teach evolution. They think, you know, they're sitting around scratching their heads, wondering about, you know, how it started and where the missing link is and all that stuff. Doesn't the Bible make it so much easier and simple? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Hallelujah, that's it. Man, I don't have to sit around and worry about all that stuff. The Bible makes things very simple to me. I don't worry about uh, nuclear extermination. I mean, I don't care what the Chinese have, the Russians have, or any other nation has. I've got a God that says in this book that He's going to keep things going. Man is not going to destroy himself. God's going to do it. God has reserved that privilege for Himself. God has reserved the privilege of blowing up this world for Himself. If you don't believe me, read 2 Peter. The Bible makes things simple. I don't worry about the environment. You know, so don't, don't use a paper because it costs trees. Man, cut the trees down. I know the one that grows trees, man. I know the one that created the trees. I'm not worried about the environment. I'm not worried about uh, uh, the things that so many other people are worried about. Why? Because the Bible makes things very simple and very easy for me. I've got a book that prophesies exactly what's going to take place in the future. When I look out here at this world and see all the things that are happening on the world scene, the only thing I can do is say, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, I'm one day closer to the rapture. I'm one day closer to the Lord coming and getting me out of this mess. My citizenship is in heaven. My life is hid with God in Christ Jesus. I am not of this world. I am not a worldling. This world's not my home. I've got a heavenly home. I've got the promise of God that He went to prepare a place for me. And if He would go, He'd come again to receive me unto Himself. And He's going to come one day and take me to that place. And when I get to that place, my worries are over forevermore. And everything's just going to be grand and great throughout all eternity. The Bible makes things so simple. I could not get in any other kind of a church outside of a Bible-believing church because I love the Word of God. I'm ruined. (laughs) I don't want to hear some mealy-mouthed preacher get up, tiptoe around issues, talk about things instead of preaching the Word of God. I've been ruined. I'm a Bible-believer. I could never get out of a Bible-believing church. If I do, it's because I've gone astray. I've messed up. I've hit the bottom. But as long as there's any little spark of spirituality in me, I'm going to be in a Bible-believing church. A preacher might preach me to the altar, but he's not going to preach me out of the church. He might preach against my sin and make me get right with God, but he's not going to preach me to the house to where I'm just going to sit there and never come back again. I'm in a Bible-believing church, been in one for 33 years, and I'll always be identified by the grace of God with a Bible-believing church. You know why some people can't get out of the Bible-believing church? Not only because they love the Lord Jesus Christ and they love the Word of God, but they see the weakness of the flesh. And they understand that the inner man is strengthened and the old carnal man is put down when they go to a Bible-believing church. Isn't it, isn't it sorry how much 
um, flesh has been exalted in so many churches throughout our nation today. You go into some of these churches and they talk about man like he's, you know, part of the Trinity. Um, this man's so great, and this man's such a great preacher, and this group's such a great singing group, and oh, we got to have them in, and oh, aren't they great, and oh, aren't they wonderful. And all I can think about is, man, the one that's been great and the one that's been wonderful in my life has been the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's something about me that, that, that says I need to be under the Word of God, and I've got... You're looking at two men tonight. You're looking at a carnal, a man that has the ability to be very carnal. And you're looking at a man that has inside him a spiritual man that wants the right things and wants righteousness. I've got a wild man here. And if I don't stay under the Word of God, man, that wild man starts taking over. That wild man, he's mean, he's crazy. He, he's capable of doing the worst things you can possibly think of. Then there's a man inside of me that desires the Word of God and desires the fellowship of the saints and desires prayer and desires the spiritual things. And brother, I'll tell you what, when I go into a Bible-believing church and the Word of God comes out and the Bible begins to be preached, brother, that inner man becomes strengthened and the outer man, he becomes weaker and Christians that go to Bible-believing churches that can't get out of Bible-believing churches see the weakness of the flesh and how the inner man is strengthened by the Word of God. Keep under the Word, and the spiritual man will prevail. Get out from under the Word, and the carnal man, the wild man, will come out, and he'll prevail. The reason why some people can never get out of a Bible-believing church is because they see that there is a great need in their life for fellowship with the saints of God. We all have our faults, we all have our flaws, and we all have our differences. But God's people are the best people on the face of the earth. I would not be here tonight if it wasn't for God's people. I would not be in this church, standing in this pulpit, if it wasn't for God's people. If it wasn't for some of you people. I wouldn't be here tonight. Some of you people have helped me greatly. Some of you people have prayed for me beyond what I even know and can understand. God will show it to me someday. But I know that some of you have prayed. Some of you have helped me down the road, my family down the road. We came up to, the, up to this church and I preached and you put in a love offering and I went down the road. And brother, I'll tell you what, it took my breath away when I saw how much God's people were willing to give me for just standing up here and preaching the Word of God. And it helped me. It got me down the road. It helped me to live. It helped me to exist. It helped me to keep on going for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know this. I need God's people. I need the fellowship of God's people. I don't look lightly on anyone. I'm thankful for every one of you. As far as I'm concerned, there's no big Christians and little Christians. There's no big eyes and little U's. As far as I'm concerned, I look at all of you the same way and you've been a blessing to me and a help to me and I am strengthened when I have fellowship with you folks. That's why we stay around after the service and we talk for an hour or two hours or three hours. I won't tonight, but I've done it all this week and it's been a help and a blessing to me. And the reason I go to a Bible-believing church and the reason why some people can't get out of a Bible-believing church, they see the need for fellowship with the saints. And then I want to say this, last of all, some people will never get out of a Bible-believing church because there's an atmosphere there that is set up by the Holy Spirit of God that you don't find in any other place. I've gone into churches where, man, I couldn't wait to get out of that church. I mean, it was dead, it was dried up, it was miserable, and I didn't want to be there. But God's Spirit works with truth. The Holy Spirit works with truth. He shows up when the truth comes out. He shows up and works in the atmosphere where the truth is going forth and the truth is going out. And I'm thankful that we still have the Holy Spirit in this world today ministering to people when the Word of God is being declared. He'll deal with a lost man about his sin. 
I don't know how that works. I've preached, I've, I've preached messages on the judgment seat of Christ and had lost people get saved. <laughs> and then I've preached messages on the white throne of judgment and had God's people get right. I don't understand how it works. I don't understand how the Holy Spirit works. I get up here and I preach a message and I'm coming down one line and the Holy Spirit's coming down another line and He's dealing with you. Why? Because He operates in an atmosphere where the truth is going forth and if the truth is going out, God will deal with you about the things that He wants to deal with you about. People come and get things right and afterwards they tell me, you know, you were preaching that message and all I could think about was this other thing. (laughs) Well, what was that? That was the Lord. And brother, I'll tell you what. When the Word of God is declared, then the Holy Spirit is able to work and minister in the midst of those people. Now, there are some people that will not be able to stay in a Bible-believing church. And then there are some people that will never be able to get out of a Bible-believing church. As far as I'm concerned... I'll never be able to get away from it. I'll never be able to get out of it. I don't want to get away from it. Because if I get away from it, I know what's going to happen. I'm going to go down, down, down. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, tonight, Lord, we just ask that You would take the Word, help us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, As the manner of some is. And Lord, I pray for these people that they would continually gather together here at this place at the appointed time to listen to the Word of God. And Father, regardless of who the messenger is, may they come for the message. And may they come to hear from You. And Lord, may they come to get strengthened in the inner man. And Lord, may they come to get exhorted in this day of darkness as we see the day approaching. Father, I pray that You'd bless this church. I pray that You'd bring others into this place that desire to hear the Word of God. I pray that this church would always specialize in the book, in the preaching and teaching of Your Word. I pray, Lord, that it would never come to the place where the main attraction would be some social outlet But Lord, may it always be the Word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that You'd bless Brother Art Martin as he pastors this church. And Lord, I pray that You'd bless his people. Lord, I know that the devil will try to assault them and next week is going to be a very tough week for some people in this building tonight. People that have come and and they've gotten up on the mountain a little bit and they've Uh, been stirred a little bit. And Lord, I know the devil is going to want to try to waylay them this upcoming week. And I pray that You would protect them. I pray, God, that You would help them. I pray, Lord, that You would keep them strong. I pray that they would keep their eyes on You, Heavenly Father, and that they would realize that uh, one of these days soon You're going to sound that trumpet and come and get us out of this world. Father, I pray for this work that You might bring others to it. Maybe there's someone in here tonight that's been sitting here in the pew. They've never stepped forward and said, I want to be a part of this work. I want to be a member of this church. Maybe they need to consider that tonight, Lord. Maybe there's somebody in here tonight that is a member, but they've sort of shrunk back and not really fulfilled their obligations like they ought to as a member of a church. They haven't been praying for the work and for the pastor, and they haven't been faithful in coming to the services like they should. God, I pray that You would deal with them about these things and may they realize when they're not here that they're missed and when they're not here, there's an empty spot and when they're not here, uh, there's a part uh, uh, that's just missing. And Father, may they realize that uh, they do make a difference. And God, I pray that You would deal with hearts tonight about these things. Father, strengthen some of these people. Maybe there's someone here tonight, Lord, that needs to get something right or they're they're going to sink, they're going to go out. And Lord, may it not take place. May they always stay and desire to stay in a church where the emphasis is placed on You and on Your Word. And we'll thank You for what You do and how You deal with us. In Jesus' name, Amen. What page will we sing, brother? 401. As we sing page 401, the Lord has spoken to your heart tonight. 
Uh, maybe you're in here and you've not really joined in and become a member of this church. Maybe you need to consider that tonight. At least come and talk to Brother Art about it. Maybe in here tonight there's somebody just sort of hovering, sitting on the fence. And uh, you need to get in here all the way tonight. I don't know how God has spoken to your heart, but you do what the Lord speaks to you about doing as we sing this song. Give you rest by trusting in His Word. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. Before we sing that next verse, let me say this, you know, preacher after he's preached a while he can always recognize some t telltale signs and I tell my people when I see the signs when I see the signs that indicate to me that they're shrinking back and they're not right up there on the firing line where they ought to be I tell them I tell them and you can always tell somebody who's really not in there you know you're preaching to them and the next thing you know they're reading their Bible well you got all week long to read your Bible you're not fooling anybody when you're sitting there acting like you're reading the Bible. You know what you're doing? You're shrinking back. You're shrinking back. When I start preaching a message and I look out there at people, they can't uh, focus and keep any eye contact. When you're coming down the pike on something, it's because they're shrinking back. Pretty soon the joy is gone. Pretty soon the heart is hardened. Pretty soon the callous look and the glazed look comes over their countenance. And all, once it's over, they'll go right back into their mode of smiling, shaking hands, and acting like everything is great. But any preacher that has preached any length of time at all can tell the signs when he sees them. Now, I'm not going to say that I've seen the signs tonight. Because to be quite honest with you, you all have been very attentive. And you've been a blessing all this week. But perhaps there's someone here that I can't see the sign on. But inside, things just aren't the way they ought to be. You need to come tonight. You need to get it settled. We're going to sing another verse. And if God spoke to your heart, you come as we sing on the second verse. For Jesus shed His precious blood rich sings to bestow Plunge now into the crimson flood that washes white as snow. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. We're going to sing one more verse and then I'm going to ask Brother Martin to come. But let me say this to you tonight. Don't let the devil ever tell you that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. You're going to get everything you need right here at this, in this church because I know Brother Martin preaches the Word of God. I know Brother Martin prays. And I know Brother Martin has a heart of compassion for his people. And you're going to get everything you need right here. And don't let the devil come along and tell you, hey, it's a little greener over here. It's not. And if you're here, stay by the stuff. And if you need to be in here, then get in all the way and be a blessing and let God use you. We're going to sing the third verse. If anyone needs to come and pray, you come as we sing on this verse. Yes, Jesus is the truth, the way that... 